Okay, so uh, welcome to our Ethics Center event here. Um, this is our ethical leadership lecture. We do, th do this annually. It's part of our uh, Ethics Center lecture series. I'm Andrew Fiala. I'm a professor of philosophy and the director of the Ethics Center here at Fresno State. Um, and as you know, we're going to hear from Mr. Pete Weber here this evening. And I'm going to ask my colleague, Dr. Vina Howard, to introduce him in just a moment. Uh, but before we start, I just want to say thank you to everybody who helped make this happen. There was a, a bunch of people on a faculty committee, um, uh, and I, I'll name a few of them, Antonio Avalos, Ida Jones, Lynn Forsyth, Jana Sahachin, Mariana Adagnostopoulos, Jack Benega, and especially Emil Milavoy, who is the director of the Lyle Center for um, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And Emil and I have been working on this project for a number of years. And the idea is to pick someone in the community who we can look to as a role model uh, for our students and for the community. Um, and we've been able to collaborate with the Better Business Bureau and we do a tele television event that's part of this process. And this morning we had Mr. Weber come on campus and talk to about a hundred students um, who were really, I think, interested to hear his story. So um, we'll hear more from him in just a second. Let me um, then just say also thank you to our university administration, uh, Saul Jimenez Sandoval, who is our university president. When he was dean of the College of Arts and Humanities, he helped me really pull this together. So this is kind of a, a co-creation of Saul and myself from way back when, now in the seventh year. Um, this morning, we had Dean Chapman introducing Mr. Weber in the classroom, um, who's the Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities. And now with us this evening, we have Dr. Vina Howard, who is the chair of the philosophy department and the director of our Gandhi Center here on campus, and is an all-around awesome and supportive colleague. So, Dr. Howard, I would like you to ask you to introduce Mr. Weber. Thank you, Dr. Fiala, and uh, thank you, Mr. Weber, for being here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read a short um, introduction for um, Mr. Weber, and then I'm going to give just a half a minute, one minute, my reflection on your talk uh, this morning and how uh, I told you that how inspired I felt, and I don't take that lightly when I feel that. Um, so I'm so it's, it's pretty wonderful. So for the audience, I just want to read a short um, introduction. After a successful 36-year career in business, Mr. Weber retired early to de dedicate himself to civic work. Mr. Weber is founder of the Heartland Chapter of the New California Coalition and co-chair emeritus of California Forward. He serves on the board of California competes, co-chairs the working group for the California Inland Port and serves as a senior advisor to the Deliberative Democracy Lab at Stanford University. He was a founding member of the California Partnership for the San Joaquin Valley, a longtime member of the Fresno Business Council and is founder of the California Bridge Academies. So this is just a short introduction. The introduction goes for pages and please look him up. So when I went to this morning to uh, Dr. Fiala's class uh, with over hundred students and I didn't know who am I going to meet. I read about you, but I never met you. So I'm a religious studies professor. And as I was listening to you, I, was reminded of Confucius sayings. So Confucius was a great ethicist. He was a scholar of ethics and I teach all Asian religions. He has a lot of sayings about a gentleman. As a woman, we can argue about a oh, gentleman or gentlewoman, but he really meant gentle person. Um, and because back then, you know, was gentleman. So I'm going to read a couple of sayings that it um, reminded me of you. The gentleman is devoted to the principle, but he is not inflexible in small matters. The gentleman does not look for all around perfection in a single person. Otherwise you won't be able to do this community work. 
The gentleman is troubled by his own lack of ability, not by the failure of others to appreciate him. So there is a lot of sayings with just pick three. So thank you so much this morning. The ideas of trust, the ideas of showing up, tenacity, working hard, I think would be great for our other audience to hear about them. So I want to thank Dr. Fiala for putting this together. I want to thank uh, Mr. Pete Weber to be here. Thank you so much. Now floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Howard and, um, uh, and Dr. Fiala. Um, you know, I've now known um, Andy Fiala now for uh, quite a while, and uh, I, I see him as a role model for ethical leadership. And so uh, it's a very special privilege to receive this award uh, from the uh, ethics center that he runs. And uh, Dr. Howard, we just met, uh, but I am looking forward to getting to know you a lot better. Um, I think we, we've got a lot of stories to share together. Um, you know, I'm also uh, very highly honored to be in the company of uh, previous awardees, uh, Dick Johansson, Ashley Sorensen, Paul Binion, uh, Luis Santana, uh, uh, Nikiko uh, Masumoto, Jim Boren, uh, people who I know well and, and uh, you know, have admired greatly. So uh, that's, you know, just to be in their company is a great honor for me. Um, I, I remember uh, being, um, you know, in elementary school in Peru and, um, and thinking that someday I would want to win the uh, Ethics Leadership Award at Fresno State University uh, when I grew up. Um, and I suspect, you know, I can't see people. Uh, and, and so I hope you're smiling when I say that because otherwise my credibility is in the tank uh, from the get go. Um, in fact, you know, I had no clue uh, where Fresno was and had never heard of Fresno when I was in elementary school. If anybody had said, you know, what does ethics mean? Uh, they would have gotten a very blank stare back from me. Um, I, um, uh, but I want to start there because, um, you know, my belief is that for most of us, a life is a, you know, a, a lot of twists and turns. Um, and um, uh, Andy, I'm, on my screen, I'm seeing Vina Howard's um, name, uh, is that the way it's supposed to be? Yeah, you you should. You're we're seeing you. Okay. All right. We're Perfect. Okay. Just checking. Um. So um, you know, twists and turns. Um. Dr. Fiala has asked me to share my journey with you, emphasizing the experiences that shaped my values. Um. And uh. And, and you know, the point I I want to make. One of the points I want to make is that um, uh, we really don't know where life is going to take us. And that what is more important than knowing the destination is um, understanding that having a strong uh, moral compass, a strong set of values uh, that guides our choices are uh, what makes you know for a, a meaningful life. Um, and we're not born with a set of values. Uh, we develop values as our lives unfold, and they uh, in turn determine the choices we make about how we live our lives, about how we think and how we act. We may not always be aware of the values that are guiding our choices, but as adults, uh, they are always there in the background. Um, receiving this award has caused me to uh, look back to identify my personal values and what helped to shape them. Uh, I'm not going to uh, list them all because uh, there's too many, uh, but I will talk about those that I think are, uh, you know, that I think about most frequently. Um, and uh, first, um, first of those is always remember that uh, trust is the coin of the realm. Uh, if people trust you, you can move mountains. Uh, if they don't, uh, you won't get much done, at least not sustainably. Uh, second, um, try to always think uh, and act as a civic steward. Uh, recognize how important to leave uh, it is to leave the corner in which you stand uh, in better shape than the way you found it, uh, and be open to opportunities 
to serve causes greater than yourself. The third is uh, to try to always be the adult in the room. Uh, what I mean by that is that we all, and I, I think uh, Dr. Howard made reference to this, we all you know, tend to uh, have a tendency to focus on other people's um, uh, differences with us instead of you know, what we have in common. Um, and uh, I can't begin to tell you how much drama I've seen in my life that doesn't need to be there. I mean, it happens everywhere. It happens between siblings. It happens in marriages. Uh, it certainly happens, you know, in business. It happens, you know, in every uh, form of life. And and I just greatly admire those people who can stand above that and be uh, the adults in the room. A fourth, um, I believe that all of us who you know aspire to be ethical leaders um, actually need to get things done. And so I, I think it's important to prepare ourselves uh, well. I like to be, I, I like to say, you know, uh, you wanna be where opportunity meets preparation because uh, the opportunities are gonna be there. So are gonna be the challenges, but you know, when the opportunities surface, you wanna be there. Um, fifth, uh, you know, be persistent, be tenacious. Uh, get things done. Uh, whatever you do, do it well. That will open, uh, always open up op opportunities for you to do other good things. Uh, I find too, too often that uh, people crumble uh, when they run up against adversity. And um, so, so that's a, a point that I will make as, as we go forward. And finally, I just remember to say thank you. All of us achieve what we do on the shoulders of others and uh, you know, with the uh, uh, in the company of those around us. Uh, so th th those are some of the values I want to highlight. Uh, and now I'm going to take you on that personal journey that Dr. Fiala uh, asked me to speak about. As I still tell my story, you're going to find that um, the process of shaping one values one's values can be messy. Um, there are some people who, from a very young age, have a very clear idea of what they want to be. You know, I want to be win Wimbledon. I want to be a philosophy professor. Uh, I want to be a cop or a firefighter uh, and so on. But uh, I, I, I was never one of those young people. Uh, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, well into my teens, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and I suspect that's more the rule rather than the exception. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, that's that's OK. Uh, you know, and I was, I was saying that to the young people in, in the class um, this morning. Um, now, I, I was born in Peru and I my family was middle class. Now, middle class in Peru meant that I belong to uh, eight percent of the population, uh, which represented the middle class. There was five percent that were upper class and the remaining 87 percent were all. Uh, lower class and uh, with a yawning gap between the lower class and the middle class. Um, uh, I did not, you know, have the privilege of wealth, uh, but I had, I was much better off than most of the people, you know, in the country in which I lived. Uh, and I also had the great fortune, the privilege of having um, been raised by a very loving family. Um, when I was, you um, 11 years old, this gets into the messy part. When I was 11 years old, uh, for the first time, you know, my my parents uh, gave me an allowance. Uh, the allowance was three solas per day. Uh, the, the soul is the um, the currency in Peru. Um, and uh, soul today is about um, 30 cents or so, uh, 30 American cents. Uh, and I, I'd get about three solas, you know, so about a dollar a day. You know, remember that was when I was 11. So, you know, that was a fair amount of money. And there was a bakery uh, about two and a half blocks from my home. And I would go there and I would uh, once a week, you know, load up on candy and, and you know, some bakery goods and so on uh, that I liked. And, um, uh, you know, I, I did that for quite a while. And then I discovered in my mom's closet someday when she wasn't around that she had a container full of silver solas. This was real silver. And um, I took one of them 
and I took it to the bakery and I discovered that I got about six times as much, uh, you know, uh, as many goodies as I did with the regular soul. And so that was pretty cool. And so I did it again. And about the fourth time I did it, um, that evening, my uh, my father walked into my bedroom and said, um, uh, can we talk? And I said, sure. And he sat down across from me and he said, did you um, take um, one of your mother's silver solas and uh, buy stuff at the bakery? And I said, nope. And I got slapped across the face so hard. I mean, you know, what uh, Will Smith did to um, Chris Rock was child's play, okay? Uh, it, you know, and I was stunned because my father had never been physical with me. Um, but, you know, he said to me, I want you to remember this moment because you're going to learn one of life's great lessons. Um, and he said that anyone who wants to live a good life uh, has to understand the importance of earning the trust of others, uh, and he was, you know, he was punishing me not only because I took the silver solace, but also because I lied to him. And um, so um, that, um, uh, you know, uh, that stuck with me. In fact, here I am almost 70 years later uh, telling that story. So it obviously made an impression on me. And, um, you know, that earned trust is one of the key ingredients in the secret sauce that um uh, has guided my life and I think the life of many others. And I, I learned it through tough love. <laughs> you know, it was uh, just one example of how shaping uh, one's values can be messy. Um, I'll share one more growing up incident. I grew up in the Catholic faith um, and um, my sisters and I would go to the uh, church near our home. And um, uh, the church was, the mass was held there at 11 o'clock in the morning. And I was uh, interfering with my soccer. Um, and so um, I asked my parents uh, if it was okay, uh, this was when I was about 13, if it was okay if I took a bus to go to a poor neighborhood near us, poverty was never very far from where we lived, uh, to um, go to mass at seven o'clock in the morning. And they said, yeah, that was all right. So I did that. And um I, you know, I did that for about a year. And uh, then one day I came back from church and I sat down with my um, my parents. And I said, I, I want to talk to you. Um, and uh, they said, sure. And, you know, I said, look, I don't want to go to church anymore. And of course, they said, why not? And I said, look, you know, I go there and, uh, you know, a lot of the ritual is in Latin that I don't understand. The part that I do understand is where they ask people to make contributions to the church. And I look around me and there are all these people who are so poor that it just doesn't make any sense to me that, you know, they shouldn't be keeping as much of their money to feed their families as they could. And the second thing is, the other thing that is not in Latin is the priest uh, telling us not to... Um, uh, you know, uh, be, uh, you know, uh, with uh, people who were Protestants or Jews. And a lot of my friends were Protestants and Jews. And so, I, you know, that didn't make any sense to me at all. So as I recall, this conversation took more than an hour. Uh, but eventually my parents said, OK, you've thought it through. You don't have to go to church. And of course, my sisters want to know, well, how did you get, you know, how did you get away from having to go to church? And uh, I said, uh, as a good brother would do, I said, uh, you got to figure it out by yourselves, you know. And so um, I, uh, uh, you know, that that was a, a second lesson that, you know, actually impacted some of the decisions I made later in my life. Um, now, I, I want to fast forward. I came to the U.S. at age 17, and I came as a foreign exchange student uh, under a program called the American Field Service Um program uh, or the AFS student exchange program. Um, and I came to Oakland High School where I lived with a family my age, uh, excuse me, had a son my age. Uh, and um, Bob, uh, my AFS brother, uh, was the president of the student body. He was the quarterback for the football team. Uh, and um, he was also going with the head cheerleader, uh, which was the best part of all because um, uh, you know, she had a lot of adorable friends. Uh, and so I had a really, really good year. 
Um, and then Bob and Mary Jane decided they were going to go to Berkeley. And so I went to Berkeley as well. Um, I studied engineering at Berkeley. Uh, and then um, uh, somewhere later on, my um, uh, uh, the company that I was working for um, you know, sent me to Stanford uh, through an abbreviated MBA program. Um, now, you know, when I was going to Oakland High, I, I got to tell you, you know, it was not without some adjustments. Um, you know, I had to learn to do my own laundry and you know, a bunch of stuff like that. But additionally, uh, you know, there was one time when we were playing flag football and somebody took offense uh, over the fact that I had, um, rather than just pulled the flag, I sort of tackled him and he called me a spick and I had no idea what that meant. And of course, I couldn't Google it at that time. Okay. Um, the internet didn't exist. Google didn't exist. So the next day, I went to uh, my uh, favorite teacher at Oakland High, uh, from whom I learned to love the history of American government, and asked him what spick meant. And he explained to me that it was an ugly slur used by little people to demean uh, Spanish-speaking people from Latin America. He said I should understand that the term demeaned the people who used it rather than the other way around. And um, that stayed with me. Uh, and I think of people who discriminate against others as little people. Um, and uh, so, you know, another lesson that shaped my values going forward. Um, so, um, you know, I, I should now mention that while I was in Berkeley, uh, between my sophomore and freshman year, uh, a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to come to Fresno to work for his father uh, who ran a construction company. And so I came to Fresno, um, you know, I didn't know until he mentioned Fresno that the city existed, but I learned it that day. And uh, so I come to Fresno and it's where I met a girl from a farming family in Dinuba uh, who would become my future wife. Um, Lori has been the love of my life for over 60 years. Uh, and she's the reason I'm in Fresno today uh, receiving this award. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Professor Fiala had asked me to do this lecture that I that he referred to this morning. And uh, I told the male students in the class, I said, you know, I suspect most of you are not married. Um, I suspect most of you eventually will be married. At some point, you'll feel that you're you're in control because you've got the recliner and you've got the remote, but in fact, um, you are likely to end up wherever your wife wants you to end up, and that's in fact what happened with me. But I'm thrilled about it because um, you know I've I've, I've got uh, two awesome daughters who uh, went to Fresno State, um, influenced by my wife. Uh, they married boys who went to Fresno State, who are also awesome. Uh, we have four grandchildren. We all live within a three mile radius of each other. Uh, I love Fresno uh, and uh, I love the Bulldogs. Um, now, I'm going to now tell you a little bit about my my 36 year business career, but I'm, I'm not going to do a lot of that. I don't want to bore you. Um, I went to work for FMC Corporation, Fortune 500 company. Uh, many years later, I. Uh, was recruited from FMC, away from FMC, uh, to become CEO of an artificial intelligence company in Palo Alto. Uh, and uh, uh, when we sold that company a couple of years later, I then um, uh, took my first steps towards moving to the Valley, which as I've said, uh, was what Lori always wanted. Um, this is this company, um, you know, was in Sanger and, uh, uh, the uh, it was a publicly traded company, and the CEO at the time, a, a member of the family that started the company, had over leveraged the company, and he asked me to come in as CEO to help save the company. And it, bottom line, is it didn't work out. Um, but FMC had been after me from the time I left uh, to go to the AI company uh, to come back, and they did that, um, and. Uh, I resisted that because they wanted me to go back to Chicago and, you know, uh, as a vice president of the company. And uh, I resisted them as long as I could. I actually took most of the year off, took some courses at Fresno State, 
uh, did a lot of skiing, you know, played a lot of golf, um, uh, et cetera. But eventually FMC made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And so I decided I'd, I'd go to Chicago and then, you know, um, after a few years in Chicago, I would come back and we, you know, would retire in, in Fresno and spend the rest of my life here. Um, so when I was um, with FMC to begin with, uh, I was, um, when I was 35 years old, I was asked to manage a division of FMC in Lakeland, Florida, sits between Orlando and Tampa. And um, I, the, the division had 1,100 employees in Lakeland and operations in Brazil, uh, Morocco, Japan. Um, and um, the, the um, you know, when I got there, I discovered that in Lakeland, we there were a lot of black employees, but there was not a single black supervisor. So uh, shortly after I got there, I appointed the first black supervisor. And uh, that night at three o'clock in the morning, I got a death threat and uh, there was a flag burned inside the factory. Um, that was roughly 1975. Um, yeah, by the time I left there three years later, uh, the company uh, or the, the, the operation uh, was completely desegregated. You know, a, um, a small, perfect, a small step towards a more perfect union. Uh, again, that was in 1975. I left in 1979, actually. So uh, let's fast forward again to the time that I returned to FMC as a corporate vice president. For as long as I was at FMC, there had been this um, uh, tradition uh, where the company always organized an annual meeting um, that um, brought together the top 250 managers in the company. It's a company of 21,000 employees. And when, um, and, and it was always the same thing. It was always on Thursday and Friday morning, we discuss business, we discuss strategy, et cetera. Then Friday afternoon and Saturday was golf and tennis. And then Sunday it was go home day. Now, Saturday night, typically it was awards uh, night. So um, when it became my turn to organize the meeting, I decided I wanted to do things differently. I talked, spoke to the CEO and I said, look, I want to do it differently. I want us to meet on business and strategy for one day on Thursday. Saturday is tennis and um, golf. Um, uh, and Friday, I want to do community work. Uh, I took a bit of persuasion, but he said, OK. And the meeting was in Scottsdale, Arizona. I organized four projects uh, and staged all the materials and tools so we could uh, frame two homes for Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we uh, re-landscaped a uh, shelter for uh, uh, women that, that have been subjected to domestic violence. And we um, uh, repainted a boys and girls club. So, you know, we assigned about 60 people to each of the projects. Uh, and it's amazing how much 60 people could get done in one day, particularly if, you know, if they, they've got all the materials in hand and so on. And it turned out to be just a a great uh, team building experience um, because it happened that the company CEO was not the best carpenter. Uh, and so, you know, he was taking direction from, you know, uh, more junior managers. Uh, and at dinner that evening, you could have levitated the whole, you know, a uh, place uh, based on the, on the good feelings. I mean, it's this, there's awesome feeling that comes from, uh, making a contribution, stepping outside your com comfort zone and doing something to make life just a little bit better for others. Um, and then in 2001, um, I fulfilled my commitment to retire early. I retired with a three bucket strategy. I was going to you know, do work for about one third of my time. I was serving on two corporate boards and I added a third. Uh, I was... Um, uh, going to spend one time a third of my time playing skiing and golf and tennis and so on and then the other third was going to be community work it didn't work that way at all another one of those twists and turns what happened is um that um uh i was introduced uh by a mutual friend to the recently elected mayor of fresno alan autry 
And um, I, you know, uh, those of you who know Alan know what his background was. Uh, he was a quarterback for the Green Bay Packers, uh, and uh, he was a movie actor. Uh, and, you know, he was uh, particularly well known for his role as Bubba in in The Heat of the Night, which was a very popular series at that time. Um, he didn't know a lot of business people. So in that very first conversation, Alan says to me, uh, you've got to join my Council of Economic Advisors. So I did. And in the very first meeting of the Council of Economic Advisors, we told the mayor that uh, he should expect a economic downturn of significant duration and significant uh, magnitude. And uh, it, it was what you know became known eventually as the dot-com bust. Uh, and Alan's reaction was, I just got elected. I don't want to hunker down for the next few years. So I ended up leading a task force that produced a report called Meeting the Challenge um, that made 23 recommendations that in the aggregate would free up some investment capital for the mayor. Uh, during the course of that work, we found that Fresno, uh, the city of Fresno was spending about 70% of its general fund uh, on public safety and was on a trend line to reach 100% by 2006. And we produced a graph that showed kind of the obvious, that the more unemployment you have in a region, uh, the more public safety you need. And uh, so we said, look, if you're going to get this house in order, you're going to have to do something about the high unemployment rate that we have. And um, so, you know, we launched something called the Regional Jobs Initiative. Uh, one of my colleagues on Autry's uh, Council of Economic uh, Advisors was Ken Newby, the managing partner of Deloitte & Touche in Fresno and the chair of the Fresno Business Council. And Ken introduced me to two really amazing women. I, I remember when he first um, described Ashley Swaringen to me, he said, she's not like any 29-year-old you've ever met. And so indeed she was not. And you're all aware of her talents, uh, you know, what she did as mayor, what she's doing now as the CEO of the Central Valley Community Foundation. What you may not know is that at the time uh, when she was 29, she was working for Fresno State. And we asked uh, President Welty at that time if we could borrow her to help run the Regional Jobs Initiative. In fact, we didn't just borrow her, we stole her. And uh, she ran the Regional Jobs Initiative. Ken also uh, introduced me to Deb Nankivel, the CEO of the Fresno Business Council, who really should be here instead of me, because I see Deb as uh, Fresno's poster child for ethical leadership. Deb's a philosophy major with a law degree. Uh, she uh, worked for Common Cause in Minnesota for nine years. She was a disciple of John Gardner, one of my uh, great role models. Um, and... Um, you know, that was not the typical resume uh, for the CEO of a business organization, but we're all, you know, uh, thrilled that uh, that the position was offered to her and that she took it. Deb taught me uh, words to define very important concepts, notably civic stewardship, uh, the notion of making decisions that are in the public interest, decisions that lead to actions that leave the world a better place. Um, and the Ethical uh, Leadership Award is all the more meaningful to me because the two people who nominated for me, unbeknownst to me, uh, were Deb Nankabo and, Deb, and and Ashley Swarnchen. So uh, back to my personal journey, as Mayor Autry and his administration were initiating the implementation of the meeting, the challenge recommendations, Al-Qaeda st struck on 9-11. A few months later, uh, Alan and I were listening to President uh, George Bush's State of the Union address when he announced the creation of uh, something he called the Citizen Corps, and I suggested to Alan that um, you know we should uh, we should do that, um, and uh, he agreed. And so I said, but I you know I will I will help lead this, but only if you assign your deputy um, uh, city manager uh, to um, uh, to to the um, to the work, and uh, that person was Carla Placeberg, and. Um, uh, and, and she is still leading the Fresno Citizen Corps. She is still the only paid person 
doing that work. But over the years and beginning many, many years ago, uh, she steadily had more than 2,000 volunteers who support first responders on emergencies, uh, and they've responded to more than 1,000 emergencies since the Citizen Corps was uh, created. As further evidence of how one thing leads to another, uh, the Fresno Regional Jobs Initiative led to a number of other initiatives. First, we realized that we weren't going to fix the city's unemployment problem uh, unless we fix Fresno's K-12 system. And uh, you know, back then, the Fresno Bee carried this um, uh, front page article that uh, called Fresno Unified broke and broken. And indeed, it was both. Uh, broke in the sense of finances, and broken the sense of the academic performance of the uh, children that were going to Fresno Unified. So uh, Kurt Madden and I led a task force that produced a turnaround plan for Fresno Unified called Choosing Our Future, which you can learn about on Google. Um, second, we realized that some of our problems could be solved within the you know, confines of the city of Fresno or even the uh, Fresno County. And so uh, Mayor Autry and Ashley and Deb and I uh, all uh, persuaded Governor Schwarzenegger to create what became known as, as the Partnership for the San Joaquin Valley, which joined together all of the eight counties in the San Joaquin Valley to do some really, you know, really great things for the valley. Third, it became apparent to me that the economic cluster strategy that was the centerpiece of the Regional Jobs Initiative was not reaching some of the, uh, uh, you know, some of the people in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods in Fresno, and so. I founded something called the Fresno Bridge Academy, and I made the brilliant decision, really brilliant, to uh, contract with Reading and Beyond and with my soul brother, Luis Santana, who runs Reading and Beyond and who was a former recipient of a ethical leadership award. Um, and uh, he did a, just a terrific job. We have helped lift more than 5,000 families out of poverty in Fresno. Uh, and uh, other counties have uh, replicated the model with our help, you know, Kings County and uh, Madera County and San Joaquin County and even places as far away as Napa County. Um, I, I'm going to just summarize quickly, you know, in 2009, I was asked to uh, join the Board of California Forward, a statewide organization funded by five of the largest foundations in California who felt that California's governance was broken. Uh, and needed a, a catalyst from the outside to help uh, fix it. And, uh, you know, time permits during the q and I can tell you more about that. Um, I've uh, been, you know, uh, I'm, I'm an advisor to the Stanford Center for Deliberative Polling, and um, I've run deliberative polls with the father of deliberative polling, Professor Jim Fishkin at Stamp Stanford. And today I'm on the leadership team of a new organization called the New California Coalition, which has the ambitious goal of changing the tra trajectory of California. Too many people in California are being left behind. Um, there are too many people leaving the state. Cities like San Francisco are becoming unlivable. Uh, and that's just shameful. I mean, you, we are the by far the wealthiest state in the nation, and we deserve better than that. Um, you know, I, I'm going to um, actually skip forward because I want to allow enough time for questions uh, to close by restating the six primary values that drive my behavior. First, always remember the trust is the coin of the realm. Thanks, Dad. Um, second, uh, think and act as a civic steward, steward. And for that, I thank Deb Nackable more than anybody else. Third, Always try to be the adult in the room. So many people to thank for that. You know, George Washington, uh, you know, Nelson Mandela, John Gardner, uh, and so many others. Fourth, uh, prepare yourself well. Uh, Yogi Berra once said, if you see a fork in the road, take it. Uh, but in fact, you do have to make a choice. And so make good choices uh, by being well prepared. Fifth, be persistent and tenacious. Get things done. Don't let obstacles intimidate you. I think it was Scott Peck in his book, The Road Less Traveled, who said, life is difficult. The sooner you understand that, the easier it gets. And so just understand you're going to first face adversity, get past it. Sixth, remember to say thank you. I feel so blessed to have the family I have. 
uh, the friends and colleagues I have to live in the greatest country in the history of the world, the country that has been so incredibly generous to me. I think some who were born here uh, tend to take the blessings of America for granted, uh, while those of us who were born and lived elsewhere tend to be more appreciative um, of this nation because we know the difference. One of America's great strengths is its capacity for self-criticism. Uh, it's that self-criticism that drives our quest uh, to form a more perfect union. But there can sometimes be too much of a good thing. So remember to just say thank you for all the progress that we have made as a nation. Uh, and I say that particularly in this troubled time, um, you know, lots to be thankful for. And um, today I am particularly grateful to uh, Dr. Fiala, uh, to Fresno State, and to all of you who have uh, tuned in uh, for this webinar. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. Mr. Weber, thank you so much. Uh, what a great, great talk and um, six principles to live by. I think that's completely on target for what we were hoping for this lecture. So thank you so much. Um, let me just uh, remind the audience, this is a webinar and we have a chat function or Q&A. So if you have a question, a comment, a thought that you want to post, um, use those functions. I'll make keep my eye on that, make sure we keep track of what the questions are. And um, as folks are thinking about possible questions, let me let me point out that uh, earlier today when you talked with the students, the students sent us some questions. So maybe I'll start with one of those questions from the students, if that's okay with you. Um, and one of the students pointed out that um, this brain drain thing you spoke about, the you know sort of California problem, how, <laughs> it's a big question. But how do we fix that? What do, what do we do? um to deal with you know getting people to stay here and to be productive here and uh i mean what like are there are i mean do you have like a quick and easy answer to that huge huge <laughs> problem what is the what are the projects you're working on what are they doing in that regard yeah yeah the answer to, to do i have a quick and easy answer the answer is no <laughs> you know because <laughs> it's a very very complex set of issues but let me and i'm going to point a, a picture of what's happening in our state. I mean, you know, US News and World Report does a, a ranking of the states, um, you know, just like they do a ranking of the universities and colleges and so on, they do a ranking of the states. And uh, California, the wealthiest state in the nation, ranked 33rd in terms of the outcomes that it was generating for its population. That's shameful. I mean, that should not be. And we have trouble all over the place. I mean, it, it, it's too expensive to live in California. You know, we've got housing issues. We've got, you know, we don't have, you know, reliable energy, reliable water. Um, we have uh, home, you know, we have the worst homelessness in the nation. Uh, we have, you know, extraordinary poverty levels. So many people that live in paycheck, paycheck to check, paycheck. And unfortunately, a lot of that is a result of state policy that I think has been misguided. And so the new California coalition is taking all of that on. It's a huge, huge mountain to climb, but we are making progress. And um, the new California coalition is a relatively young organization. Um, it was started by um, uh, the uh, head of the Bay Area Council, Jim Wonderman and Tracy Hernandez from LA. And then they came to us in the Valley and we joined in as the Heartland chapter. Uh, and we are trying to restore the California dream. And I have, I have, I want to, I want to make this a hopeful conversation. So, you know, yes, you know, we are facing enormous challenges, but I am very hopeful that we're going to be able to turn uh, these things around. And we are addressing all of these challenges you know, economic opportunity, you know, that ranking that I told you about uh, from, from U.S. News and World Reports, California ranks dead last in terms of opportunity, uh, economic opportunity, uh, you know, uh, affordability and so on. So we, we're we're determined to fix that. Do, do you think that, um, I mean, I, I don't want to push this right straight to ethics, but uh, this is an ethics center lecture ethically. Do you think that part of the problem is a kind of ethical problem that, yes. um, I mean, I'll just be blunt that we've had, we, there's a lot of selfish people who sort of want to make a quick buck and then go do their thing. And all the stuff that you talked about, about civic stewardship and 
even your story about, you know, when you retired, you're planning to sort of, you know, enjoy yourself and you found yourself pulled back into this community service work. We need more people like you. <laughs> uh, what, what do you do? Do you care to comment on the sort of ethical culture of? Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, one of the other one of the students also you know, said, you know, do you run into problems? Oh, my God. Yes. You know, I run into all kinds of problems. The thing that frustrates me more than anything else is that so many of our elected leaders are really more interested in politics than they are in, you know, just, you know, creating a better world for Californians. I mean, there is no good reason for us to have the statistics that we have in California. So yes, that's very frustrated, uh, frustrating, but I'm not gonna leave California. I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna try to fix it. And I want as many of the people who are listening in on this conversation to join with me because, you know, California is a fabulous state. I mean, we have so many assets and in part, that's what's frustrating is that we have all these assets, we have so much wealth and yet, we're producing these really terrible outcomes. And so we're going to get that fixed. Can uh, just go another question that, that one of the students asked was, um, I mean, kind of a specific question about how does the Bridge Academy work? How, how do we, sure. how do you, you, you say you work with 5,000 families and lifting them out of poverty. What, what does that look like? How does that, how does that happen? And you know, sure. Also, yeah, no, how can it, folks get involved in that too? As part yeah, of it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. So, so um, let me just paint a abbreviated picture of what the Fresno Bridge Academy does. First of all, it's a two generation model. We don't just enroll somebody who's looking for a job. We enroll the the family. Okay. In fact, when we started, we would only work with families uh, that had children that were school age. Because it's a very different conversation when you go to somebody and you say, do you want to get a job? And they say, well, how much does it pay? And, you know, and then, you know, you say, well, the starting pay is going to be this much. And they say, well, you know, um, I can make that much money, uh, you know, without having to work. Uh, very different conversation. If you start the conversation by saying, how are your kids doing? And they tell you how they're doing. And you say, and you show real interest in helping them, you know, whether it's preschool, after school, you know, tutoring, whatever the issues are. Um, and when they understand that they, you know, that that you care about their kids uh, and that you're going to work with them uh, to make create a better future for their kids. Now you turn the conversation to now we need you to be the best possible role model for your kids. And so uh, that's, you know, how we engage them. And we say, okay, so let's, let's talk about you now. Let's talk about what we can do to get you into a job that has, you know, mobility opportunities. And so uh, that's been very successful. I should, I should also say that um, we start by identifying people's strengths, their aptitudes and their passions. Okay. Because uh, I don't care, you know, how, how many aptitudes you have. If, if you know, if you don't have a passion around a subject, chances are you're not going to do very well at it. And so, you know, I shared a story with the students that, I, you know, if you don't mind, I'll share here as well. Um, you know, there's this young African American woman uh, who had a child at a very young age uh, who came to the Fresno Bridge Academy, and she was frustrated because she wanted a better future for her son. She was living with her mother and with her child, um, and as we started to assess her and help her understand her interests and attitudes, aptitudes and passions and so on, uh, you know, it became clear that you know, she, she hadn't told us this to begin with, but she was dyslexic. And so any time that we proposed, you know, a course of studies or something, you know, uh, it, it, she, she shied away from that. But we discovered that she was she loved children and she was very good with children. And we said, you know, uh, you, you have an interest in, in uh, you know, child care because it's needed. And she said, I've always thought about that. But, you know, how do we do that? And so on and so forth. So we helped her get certified to, you know, uh, do work as, as, as a uh, uh, in child care. And she started a child care facility in her own home initially. Uh, you know, she was certified to handle four kids to begin with. And then she expanded to 14 children, uh, you know, hired some part-time people. Uh, and it's just, I mean, she's thriving today, absolutely thriving. And her son, 
uh, you know, who was a teenager at the time that she first joined the Fresno Bridge Academy, is now going to UC Merced studying pre-med. He wants to be a doctor. Um, so, you know, that's that's how it works. I, I like I like how you you were explaining this. It's um, it's I mean, really, it's just care. It's it's compassion. It's it's meeting people with uh, where they are. Yeah. Um, Let me, if, if you don't mind, I'm just going to add that, that one of the things that we relentlessly train our navigators is what we call them, our case managers, is there is no there is nothing that people ask you for which you say we don't do that unless it's illegal, of course, you know, but, you know, if they, you know, if they are facing eviction, you help them with that. Uh, and so we network with. Um, believe it or not, we network with 119 different organizations that provide services uh, to people in need. But it's almost impossible for people to navigate, you know, uh, that without some help. So, yeah. Yeah, that's th thank you. I mean, it's helpful to kind of picture how that works. There is a question in the chat from Dan Jamison, who uh, this says, he basically says, what is the current status of the inland port? Um, and maybe you could remind us why that matters and, and what that means. Yeah, yeah. The Inland Port is a project that uh, intends to take cargo that comes into the ports of LA and Long Beach in particular. And instead of, you know, taking the cargo out of the containers and shipping it north as manifest cargo, uh, we just take the containers directly and we actually take the cargo out of the containers close to the final destination of the goods. And so the idea is to have a series of, of inland ports up and down the valley. We take in a huge amount of cargo in the, in the Southern California ports that travel north through primarily uh, 99 um, and that uh, um, you know 62% of that cargo ends up in the Bay Area through warehouses that are located in the valley. So our intention is to take those containers and put them either on a rail or on hydrogen trucks, hydrogen power trucks, uh, and then move them to these inland ports where the final this you know uh, uh, final transport to or transport to the final destination, the last you know mile is what they call it, but it's more like the last fifty or hundred miles uh, is done by electric vehicles. This will massively reduce our uh, air quality issues. It will massively reduce GHG. And when I say massively, GHG gets reduced by 92%. NOx gets reduced by 84%. And in addition to that, we are envisioning that there will be uh, centers of economic activity surrounding this, these inland ports. So it'll be a huge economic development um, a project for communities in the Valley. And where it stands right now is we are still... Uh, working to try to locate the first uh, ports. We're getting very close to that. We just got um, uh, a, another award of funding from the federal government. The federal government loves this project. So does the state government. And so uh, this is in our future. Uh, and it will, you know, th this is the kind of triple bottom line project that we love because it helps everybody. You know, it's going to create lots of good jobs uh, for a lot of people in the Valley. He, I, I talked about this with you uh, at one point. You, you mentioned this um, because you you talked about the triple bottom line. You talked about the business council and so on. I, I'm going to throw kind of a softball question in your direction. Some people seem to think like business is the bad guy. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? There's like, there's a, you know, climate change, which you were just sort of mentioning uh, issues involving air quality and so on. There is a kind of view that, you know, the, the business community is all about profiteering and um, taking advantage. And and basically, that's the problem. Yeah. Can and, respond and to uh, that? Sure. Andy, uh, first of all, um, you know, you've captured California correctly. I mean, uh, you know, business. But I want to I want to differentiate between big business and small and medium sized business. Big business in particular in California has been painted as the devil. OK, uh, successfully by people who don't like business and in some cases, you know, justified by actions that, you know, selective businesses you know, have taken that were not, you know, uh, you know, not not particularly in, in, in the character of civic stewardship. OK, so that that happens just like there's bad cops. 
uh, occasionally, but the majority of cops are good cops. Same is true. I mean, I, you know, FMC Corporation was a super ethical company. Um, and but, you know, we've actually done polling and you're absolutely right that big business is seen very negatively in California. However, small business and medium sized business has some of the highest approval ratings of any profession, you know, higher than firefighters. Uh, you know, so it, there's, a, there's a dichotomy there. Uh, I also just want to point out something, Andy, that you, I'm sure you realize, but, you know, let me make your, the audience aware of that. Three of the seven ethical leadership awards that you have awarded, including mine, have been awarded to members of the Fresno Business Council, people from business. And so, you know, the, the thing is this, when business people act as civic stewards, there's no better combination because business leaders are trained to solve problems. You know, I mean, politicians, yeah, they're supposed to solve problems, right? But uh, so often they're not held accountable. Businesses are held accountable. Business leaders are held accountable. You don't get to be a manager for long if you're not producing. And so we know how to strategize, how to solve problems, you know, and so um, I, anyway, that's my answer to your question. Yeah, no, th I think this is this message. We 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 forget about this sometimes. And um, and even when you say like small business, I mean, we all have at some point engaged in business activity. We just we have to to, to exist in this world. And um, I think we need that reminder that you just gave us that that business can do a lot of good. And, um, and can, I, can I just jump in and say one more thing? An important thing for people to think about is that small businesses tend to depend on large businesses because they are suppliers to the large businesses. So, you know, that's one of the things that New California Coalition is going to try to fix is that whole perception that is just so totally unjustified uh, that paints you know, big business with this horrible broad brush that I don't think is justified. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you know, I'm I'm looking at our clock. I'm attending. We've got a, about three minutes left. Um, Dr. Howard, you turned your camera back on. I don't know if you'd like to make a offer a question or comment, and then we should conclude. I just want to, you know, thank you again. You know, you here twice and more new, more nuggets. So it was, I really like your last point that uh, small businesses. Um, I think if we don't have trust in something, we are going to be in trouble. So I think you're right that, yes, when we become too big, there is a problem. But when there are, the small businesses are keeping United States alive. And I, I agree with you with all that. And your wisdom about trust and showing up and do you have um hope for our world i just want to ask <laughs> sometimes um, <I> feel discouraged <laughs> it depends on what day of the week it is <laughs> no i you know yes i am i am an optimist i think the you know the united states has gone through you know really when you think about it much worse times than the times that we're looking at today but it is discouraging at times i mean you know it is it's dep downright depressing to see some of the you know stuff that's going on i mean you know where are the adults you know i mean you just have to wonder about that sometimes um but look we will we will get past where we are and uh, we will come out okay i mean think about you know the great depression the second world war i mean got go back to the civil war i mean you know we've gone through an awful lot and uh so um you know i i think we'll, i i think we're going to be okay the, i i love i like that conclusion um and maybe that's a good place to stop uh and the like as we end just remind our students and our listeners that it's not going to get better unless they get active um and you provide a great model especially with so many hats that you're wearing and so many projects that you've been involved with um the energy you have uh for all of this is more than enough for like three people so uh congratulations on all the the work and all the contributions you've made and thank you so much on behalf of Fresno State and the Ethics Center and my colleagues and our students. Um, thank you for spending your time with us today. Uh, we, we're, we learned a lot from you. We're recording this. We're going to share it with the community. So, Mr. Weber, thank you again very much. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Howard. Thank you so much.
Have a good Thank evening. Thank you. you. All too. right, folks. Thank Bye. you. Have a good evening.